Thank you very much and good evening. Um, I'm Mary Watson, Executive Dean at the New School, and I'm here to welcome you to this uh, Times Talk at the New School, um, our 46 joint event sponsored here since 2003. We are very proud to be in collaboration with the New York Times Talks. Um, these um, talks really reflect our dedication to cultural and social issues and to supporting expression of the arts, social science, and the media. And tonight, I'm particularly pleased to have the opportunity to open this event because tonight's program includes Nina Khrushcheva, who's a New School faculty member, professor of international affairs in our Julian J. Studley graduate program in international affairs. Nina is a prominent political commentator, particularly on US-Russia relations. And so now, to begin tonight's program, please welcome Jennifer Steinhauer, editor of live journalism at the New York Times Washington, D.C. Bureau. Thank you for coming, and thank you to those of us who are joining us also via live stream. Have a great evening. Good evening. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to see all of you tonight um, and to have the chance to bring our Washington reporters and our reporting uh, north on the Acela. I, I took the Northeast Regional, but that's just me. Um, I would like to give a special welcome to our New York Times subscribers and to thank you truly for uh, the role you play in making our journalism happen. This evening's uh, discussion is brought to you by the New York Times Subscriber Events Program, which brings our readers behind the scenes of the New York Times. Last year, we presented 150 such programs and opportunities to engage with our journalists. Some events are open to all subscribers, and some, like tours of the newsroom here and down in Washington, are only for subscribers who are part of our loyalty tier. For example, we have an upcoming conference call on the opioid crisis, and subscribers will get to uh, call in, hear from reporters who've been traveling across the country covering the story, and ask questions. It accommodates uh, 1,000 callers. We would really love to have you join us on that. But tonight we're talking about Russia. There are a few stories that have so dominated the news and been, frankly, so dominated by the New York Times newsroom than the multifaceted, often confusing, but always fascinating controversy that has clouded the Trump presidency. Our reporters have spent the last year examining what, if any, role the Kremlin played in the 2016 race for the White House, and whether the president tried to obstruct the ongoing FBI investigation. We've also been front and center in breaking news on the investigation by special counsel Robert Mueller. So now, it was great pleasure that I introduce my colleagues, Mark Mazzetti, Michael Schmidt, and Scott Shane, who will explore all of this and more, with Nina Kusheva, a professor of international affairs here at the New School. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We've uh, done one of these events before in Washington. It was about a month ago. And um, since then, and that went pretty well. Um, <laughs> but since then, we've, we've worked on some new material. We, um, we've got a new lead singer in Nina. And um, we're in a bigger venue playing here in New York City. So um, this is like sort of the big time for us. We might add a keyboardist before our big Midwest tour through Chicago, Cleveland, and Detroit. <laughs> so um, I hope you guys in, uh, enjoy the night. It's, um, as Jennifer said, it's been, um, without a doubt, the most all-consuming, competitive, and, and maddening story of the past year. And uh, I don't know whether at the end of tonight all of it will be clear. <laughs> um, and if it is, please tell us, because we're <laughs> seeking clarity in this story. Um, but uh, I think it will be certainly eventful and a lively discussion. And we are going to leave plenty of time for questions that hopefully we can answer. And uh, the tough ones I saw our editor, Dean Baquet, somewhere in the audience, he'll take the really tough ones <laughs> at the end of the night. So let's jump right into uh, the questions and um, get at some of the big topics that we're here to discuss tonight. And the first one I want to give to Scott, uh, who um, has followed this aspect fairly closely. And I wanted him to sort of start out by explaining the contours of what we now describe as the Russian campaign to influence the last election. I think it's broadly accepted uh, by most that the, the, that the Russian government, the Russians tried in some capacity to disrupt the election. Uh, and I wanted Scott to first sort of explain what happened and a little bit about the impact it had or didn't have. 
So it is widely accepted. There is a very prominent American who um, is unconvinced <laughs> and believes it's a hoax. Uh, but the, um, you know, and, and you guys know all this, but let me just run through it because um, I, th I think it's, you know, over the months, um, it's possible to kind of lose track of some aspects of it. But basically, we know that Russia, and there's some dispute as to exact, the exact groups, the exact control of Putin and so on, but Russia, Russians, the Russian state, um, hacked into a bunch of democratic targets. There, there was nothing unusual about that. Um, we do it to them all the time, they do it to us all the time. Um, but then the next step was really kind of crossing a Rubicon, and that was leaking the stuff. And um, then on top of that, there was the social media campaign, which only kind of became clear over the last few months, um, especially the dimensions of it. And, and the social media companies were very reluctant. You know, they were, they were taking the pose that they were a neutral platform and they didn't really know what was on their platforms, and it wasn't their fault if anyone didn't like anything on their platform, and they've been forced to, to adjust that position. But it took them a long time to kind of come clean and do their own research um, on, on what happened there. So the, um, you, you know, but, but now the scale is pretty significant. You know, early on you heard, you know, there were $100,000 worth of Facebook ads, and, and that was insignificant. But in fact, um, it's, it's not just the ads, as uh, those of you who use Facebook know, it's, it's posts, and ads are usually just paying to, to promote a, a post. And Facebook now estimates that 126 million Americans saw the Russian content. Most of this stuff was, it, much of it was pro-Trump, much of it was anti-Clinton, and some of it was uh, simply playing on issues like guns and race um, on both sides uh, to sort of stir, stir the pot. And you know, remarkably, this, this just came out recently, um, those Facebook pages, all of which were posing as American activists or American, you know, Americans with interest in particular topics, they promoted 129 events like meetings, demonstrations, rallies, um, and uh, on 13 from 13 different pages. They would just call uh, you know, a rally in one town or another, say, everybody be there at 2 o'clock on Saturday to, to um, protest immigration. And uh, remarkably, um, 25,800 uh, Facebook users said they were going to attend those events. Facebook doesn't know how many actually showed up. There was a little bit of documentation. It showed at least small groups showed up for some of these things. So it's kind of remarkable. They're sitting over in, uh, you know, in, in Moscow or in St. Petersburg, uh, probably St. Petersburg, and uh, creating these pages. And it must have been kind of fun. Like, hey, everybody in Omaha, come and stand up for gun rights at noon on Saturday. Um, and, you know, on, on Google, they found, um, you know, uh, I think 10 channel, or no, sorry, 18 channels uh, on YouTube that uh, were putting out this content. They I, eventually, at least so far, they've identified 50,000 plus, um, uh, you know, accounts on Twitter that uh, put out uh, a couple million tweets. You know, as a percentage of, of all the um, s stuff going on in the election, it was probably not that huge. Um, but it, but its, its dimensions have actually grown to the point where it's hard to, to be dismissive about it. So just briefly, um, let me uh, kick around a little bit the question of, did this matter? Because, you, you know, I think through the debate over the months uh, about this stuff, you could hear a lot of people say, it didn't matter. Uh, on the other side, you know, some people saying it did. Um, I think it's really hard to dismiss it now. If you think about, um, you know, what the impact of the leaks were, if you remember on the eve of the Democratic National Convention, they dumped about 20,000 DNC emails uh, out um, through WikiLeaks, and that was all that embarrassing stuff about how clearly the DNC staffers were uh, you know, sort of tilting towards uh, Clinton and away from Sanders. Uh, and it was embarrassing enough that it forced uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the chairwoman of the convention and of the party, to resign 
uh, on the eve of the convention. So completely disruptive in that way. Whatever communication strategy they had, uh, obviously was blown apart. And then the um, John Podesta, her cam Clinton's campaign chair chairman, his emails, they grabbed his Gmail and uh, WikiLeaks dribbled those out starting October 7th, which happens to be the day that the famous Access Hollywood tape of Donald Trump uh, came out. And also the first finding by the, um, uh, by the FBI and, uh, and DHS that the Russians intervened in the election. All that happened on October 7th, big day. Um, but Podesta's emails started coming out and instead of dumping them all as they had the DNC emails, they dribbled them out all the way to the election. So, and you know, among other things, um, there were quotes from those emails, in particular from, from some of those speeches that, that um, the Clinton campaign had refused to release, the speeches to banks and so on, um, where the Trump folks found some juicy quotes. You might remember the one that says, every politician needs a private policy and a public policy and so on. And I'm sure uh, you know, there were explanations for them, but certainly out of context, they, they, they spelled trouble. And if you go back and look at some of Trump's big speeches after October 7th, the centerpiece of, of some of his big speeches in front of 20, 25,000 people were nuggets from those emails. So um, if, if you add up the, the disruption of the DNC and the convention, the, um, the drip, drip, drip effect of, of the Podesta emails, the role those played in Trump's speeches, and you know, 126 million people seeing the Facebook stuff. And then when you think that the margin in the election was 100,000 votes in three states, it's hard, you, know, you can't say one way or the other whether this made the difference, but it's, I, I think at this point it's hard to say it didn't make any difference. And why don't I leave it there? So, uh, so Nina, uh, Scott's just laid out what the what what the what the campaign was in its, in its broad brush. And I think so. I have two questions for you. The first is, uh, what is what what was the Russian government's uh, motives, objectives behind this? If we accept that Russians or the Russian government was behind what Scott described, what were the what were the motivations? And secondly, I think if you could give a little bit of a description of how coordinated you think this was? I mean, I think the, the image that the media and others have portrayed is of Putin uh, you know, as this Bond villain sitting in a chair stroking a cat, <laughs> you know, masterminding this whole thing. But uh, you know, that's probably a pretty simplistic view of how the Russian intelligence uh, services work. Can you explain a little bit what you think about how coordinated it really was? Thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm local. Just want to say, I'm also Russian, please don't hold it against me. <laughs> I'm not here for beating purposes. Um, so just want to say October 7th, Putin's birthday, <laughs> incidentally. And so things happen on Putin's birthday. Uh, you never know what exactly they might happen, but they do. So I would not really think that it's such a coincidence that it did happen exactly then. Um, then you know, we can, we would never really know that it is the Russian government. When the American uh, intelligence services say we're pretty sure, they will always be pretty sure, they'll never be sure. Because one of the things that I know about my country, my Russians, is that um, that villain that people want to uh, think about is not the one who's just sitting there and taking notes and on page 125 it would be, and tomorrow we are going to, um, hack something and then release something. We are really not uh, that kind of um, adversary that America was obsessed before it became obsessed with the Russians, that is Germany. Uh, that is the exactitude, we don't have those. Uh, so for, for the Russians it was, I think, the original idea if we assume that uh, the Kremlin was behind it and I believe that uh, to a certain degree it was because this kind of operations uh, rather, regardless of how big or uh, big they become, uh, originally do not happen without um, a bit of a 
oversight or at least some sort of, you know, make sure that American elections work out well for us, <laughs> uh, something like that. Uh, so the, the original idea was, from my point of view, was certainly embarrass Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was a thorn in Putin's eye for a really long time. You remember that um, uh, very unfortunate reset in 2009 that uh, she did as a Secretary of State with um, Barack Obama as president. She was a reluctant, uh, from what I understand, in that particular policy, but the idea was that um, you know, now Russia and America would be friends. It didn't work out well because they had the wrong button and really just did not work very well um, um, and just went from there. Uh, and she has always been a woman in pants, so to speak, uh, and uh, um, rather tough with uh, um, the Russian establishment, Russian foreign policy establishment that really didn't sit well with the um, those people in power because uh, Russia is rather patriotic, uh, sorry, patri <laughs> patriotic and patriarchal. Um, I used to have a joke that Russia is so patriarchal that even our first lady is a man. Uh, <laughs> as you may remember, Putin left power sort of, in 2008 and became the prime minister. And for four years, there was a seat warming president, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who was really very first lady-ish, kind of, that's kind of <coughs> decorative, you know. <laughs> Let's do modernization, here are some napkins, you know, sort of, this kind of thing. Anyway, uh, so Putin, Putin comes back and uh, Hillary Clinton is in, um, sort of full force and uh, um, sort of a few years forward, uh, Crimea happens. Remember that Russia next Crimea from uh, Ukraine in 2014 and you know, some of it was prepared but a lot of it was also um, a great upset that for Olympics today. Um, the Olympics in Sochi, the Winter Olympics in 2014 were not attended by um, all the Western powers and really Putin built it for the Western powers and all other powers to attend. Uh, so she, Hillary Clinton walks out and says, Putin is just like Hitler. And that became a big problem because as you know, Russia did lose Soviet Union, lost more than any other country in World War II and it was a remarkable insult. And it is really actually, I take issue with reporting on that because uh, most regrettably she wasn't held responsible uh, for that kind of insult because some of the idea often is that um, although it is politically incorrect to insult many countries or many uh, groups, uh, it is okay to uh, be very nasty to the Russians because they're kind of a traditional Cold War enemy to the United States. Uh, and that, well, actually, I think that's when for Putin that became the beginning of the end, is that when uh, there would really be no ethical consideration for uh, Hillary Clinton and all bets were off and they really became bets were off. Uh, so I think the original idea to come back uh, to the original question was to very much embarrass Hillary Clinton, and if she gets elected president, I believe that, like everybody else, the Russians also thought, I mean, please, even the Russians didn't think that Donald Trump could make it. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it was to just make her victory more difficult, to show what the Russians can do, so when she becomes president, then she would have to take the Kremlin and the Russians into account. So Putin was showing he's not just that regional power that Barack Obama was so dismissingly called him in 2014. So I think that was pretty much behind uh, sort of the grand scheme. Uh, and as for coordinated, as I said, we are really not, not that kind of gold fingerish. Uh, we may appear that way, uh, and Putin is certainly playing that, that role. I mean, that naked boobs and you know, things that he does as a James Bond of contemporary Russia certainly plays, plays into that persona, but uh, it is 
probably most likely on a lower level flunkies, on people who are patriotic about Russia, something about October 7th, which is important. Uh, and so they would start, and I think eventually all these many centripetal and centrifugal forces started forming into something bigger. And I think that's when they realized that they have something. And also Americans were reacting a certain way. And uh, in order to, just to conclude, look, it, it was, and he's a, he's not a Soviet man, but he's a Cold War man. He's not necessarily a Soviet man, but he's a Cold War man and he's a KGB man. And for every KGB officer, it was a dream to uh, be known or to be thought of as somebody who can take down American democracy. I mean, that's an image question. And for him, that image uh, was very important. He was even able to, uh, for him, that image around the world would be probably even more important than uh, kind of partnership and parity with the United States. So there's this campaign that's been described, well described and the, the motivations have been well described and now gets us the question of uh, there's this ongoing federal investigation into the current administration and um, really that kind of has two halves to it. And Mike, I want you to describe one half and I'll take the other half. But um, you know, as we all know, the FBI was, was looking at this issue uh, for some time going back July of 2016. And um, uh, Trump kind of inherits it. He's told early on and he sees news reports that there's an FBI investigation. <laughs> and then the question becomes, um, did what did Trump do to try to undermine the investigation? He's, as we know, pretty obsessed with the idea that there's an ongoing Russia investigation uh, by his own government, by the FBI. So the question is, it, has he tried to obstruct it? And you've done a lot of reporting on that. What's the sort of, what's, don't make the case for obstruction, but what are the sort of elements uh, of it right now? So if you think about Mueller's investigations, there's, it's sort of like three big buckets. There's a finance bucket, Trump's finances. There's a bucket about collusion. Did Trump collude with the Russians? And then there's a bucket about obstruction. The thing that we know the most about, that Mueller has the most things to look at, is the obstruction bucket. It's what did the president do when he came in office in terms of the Russia investigation? What were his motivations? Was he trying to end it? Was he trying to stop it? And that is something that Mueller has spent an enormous amount of time drilling down with White House officials on. He's basically interviewed every important person around the president who could speak to his mindsets and his intentions about these things that he did. Looking at asking the FBI director for loyalty, asking the FBI director to end the investigation into Mike Flynn, his national security advisor. The constant obsession with Jeff Sessions, his attorney general. The president got very, very angry when he heard that Sessions was going to recuse himself, had his White House counsel lobby Sessions not to recuse himself. And then when he found out that he had, basically said, I need an attorney general who can protect me. And why does that matter? Why does, why does the idea that Sessions had recused himself matter to Trump? So Sessions is the most high profile national politician to embrace Trump. He's his closest political ally, certainly during the campaign. No one in the Republican establishment wanted to be associated with Donald Trump, but Jeff Sessions was one of his biggest supporters. And as soon as Trump got elected, he put Sessions in as his attorney general. When we sat down with Trump in the Oval Office in July, I mean, this is the interesting thing about Trump, is we spend all this time trying to find out things he did behind the scenes. But in an interview in the Oval Office, he said to us, I never would have made Jeff Sessions my attorney general if I knew he was going to recuse himself. <laughs> so it's this constant obsession with loyalty. And it's, was, is the president someone who simply prizes loyalty? This is someone who came up in New York real estate, thinks loyalty is really important and believes he needs loyal people around him and that's just who he is? Or does he prize this loyalty because he believes he needs people to protect him? Is there something to hide? And that's the central question of obstruction. And the thing to understand about obstruction, which is different than collusion in the finances, is that Mueller has much more accessibility there. It's very difficult to go back and figure out 
you know, whether this Trump associate had a latte with this Russian official in the Czech Republic in 2016. But when he has access to documents, emails, and witnesses from the White House, that is just simply an area where he can play and he can get many more things. And that, in, when I look at these different buckets, I think if the president has a problem, it's in the obstruction area. But one of the questions, of course, it raises, and you know, legal experts will say, um, you know, you, there's no obstruction if there's no underlying crime here, right? If, uh, although you'll get an argument on that. And, and so then the question then becomes, uh, what is he trying to obstruct? What is he hiding? Is there anything actually at the basis of this? And that gets to the question of, um, was there, the common term is collusion during the campaign? Uh, what, what are the president's ties to Russia, financial and otherwise? And that has been, I'd say, the you know, the thing that we as an organization, news organization, has probably spent the most time trying to get to the bottom of. It's the, it's the most difficult. It's, it's the, uh, the part of the case that has led us to a lot of different, in a lot of different directions and frankly some, some dry holes, but, um, you know, but also some really interesting stories that, that get you, I think, a lot of the, the, a lot of the way there. Um, I, guess, I guess my overall view, and we can have a discussion about this, is, is that you know, to this day, uh, we don't know of any hard smoking gun piece of evidence that showed you know, the president or the president-elect at the time you know, colluding with the Russians, wanting to collude, ordering a close association with the Russians who are carrying out the campaign that Scott and Nina talked about. Um, but there's been a lot of, um, uh, of evidence dug up along the way that show a lot of people in his campaign were certainly very interested to collude. They were interested in working with the Russians as the sort of joke around the office is sometimes we say, you know, they were curious about, they were collusion curious. Um, <laughs> and so they, um, if you take one example, there's the, uh, you know, the now infamous Trump Tower meeting in June of 2016, when the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., was offered, uh, basically was told about dirt about Hillary Clinton. Uh, through an intermediary, a guy he knew uh, from uh, who he had known going back some years when Trump brought the Miss Universe pageant to, to Moscow. And he's offered, he's told this, these Russians are coming to Trump Tower, they're going to offer dirt. And Donald Trump Jr.'s uh, answer was, I love it. And in specifically, I love it, especially later in the summer. In other words, closer to the election when it'll have a bigger political impact. Um, you know, that is a story that the administration denied over several days, and the Times brought them brought in, uh, an increasing amount of evidence that this was not what they originally said it was, and it was quite embarrassing uh, for the administration. And more than that, we know that Mueller is sort of honing in on that meeting. Um, there's a number number of other um, instances that have been unearthed, in, including by by Mueller when he talks about a campaign aide named George Papadopoulos, who is a young foreign policy advisor who was uh, who had made contact contact which, with a professor in London who turns out seems to be some kind of Russian intelligence operative who tells him about uh, dirt uh, about Hillary Clinton in, in the form of thousands of emails. And he's even introduced young George Papadopoulos to someone who he described as Putin's niece. We believe Putin doesn't have a niece, right? Um, George didn't know that, know. but um, he went along. And um, so it's these, it's these sort of stories that you know, taken together provide an, a, a quite an interesting case, but what has been, I think, uh, frustrating for all those looking at it is to sort of try to, to see where it ultimately ends uh, and to see, well, well, how involved was the president? And I think that we can say we still, you know, February 13th, 2018, we still don't quite know. And certainly it's something we know Mueller's looking at, um, as well as this question of, um, what before the election, what in the years past might have bound Trump to the Russians? Was there any kind of political dealings, financial dealings, uh, things that may have made him beholden to the Kremlin that would make him, in fact, ne perhaps want or need to work with the Russians during the campaign? And that's another thing that we don't, um, we, we, we are, there's been a lot of interesting reporting on, but the jury is still out on that front. So. Um, I think that you know, we, are, we expect that Mueller will be uh, presenting more of his case in the coming weeks. Uh, we think that he's actively looking to interview the president and 
one would think in the course of an investigation like this, if you're looking to interview the top person, that would indicate your, your investigation is coming toward an end. But we're not making any bold predictions here tonight because this story has thrown us enough curveballs along the way. Um, so these are all the elements of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the case and the um, investigation as we have been reporting it. And I wanted to sort of go over a few more things before opening it up to questions because there's obviously a lot to talk about and we're not going to get through um, everything tonight. Um, I think that we, we have to, uh, we'd be remiss if we, if we didn't bring up tonight the question of this dossier that is so become so much of the uh, subject of the political discussion and increasingly part of the partisan fight over this investigation. It's the Republicans have tried to use the dossier as uh, something that the FBI relied on um, and Mueller rel has relied on. Um, and it, here it was, this political document paid for by Hillary Clinton operatives. Um, Scott, can you give a sort of nutshell description of where we are on the dossier now, and and I know it could that could take all night, but but <laughs> but but I'm sure there'll be questions about it all. But where are we on the dossier? One, almost like a little over one year after we first heard about it. Yeah. So, dossier 101. Um, Christopher Steele is a retired uh, British MI6 uh, officer, a British intelligence agent who focused on Russia. Um, after he left MI6, he started his own uh, research firm, mostly focused on Russian stuff. So he was tapping into um, Russians. He knew people um, outside Russia, often um, Rus you know, Russians living in other countries who had contacts inside. So he had a whole network of people he could work. And he did a lot of work on Russia for corporate clients. And then he gets a client, which is Fusion GPS, this small DC-based research firm run by former reporters. Uh, and that research firm, was Fusion GPS, was first hired um, by uh, Washington Free Beacon with money from Paul Singer, uh, a, a Republican um, you know, donor. Uh, and then, uh, as Trump became the nominee, um, obviously, the Republicans were no longer, no, no longer interested, but Hillary Clinton's campaign was very interested. So they started financing the same effort, and that was sort of when Steele came into the picture. And the dossier, for those of you who haven't looked at it, is not actually about 30 pages long. It's not an actual formal dossier. What it is is a collection of reports done over um, quite a few months. What is it, about July to December, I think, uh, of 2016? And these are sort of his reports that he's sending to Fusion GPS as he hears stuff. And uh, you know, as, as um, many people pointed out, it's, it's more along the lines of raw intelligence as opposed to what they call finished intelligence. In other words, the wheat and the chaff haven't been fully sorted, but this is what people are saying. We're, we're hearing this from people who've been reliable in the past. We think this might be true. So it's kind of a hodgepodge. And, um, now, the, um, the way it's become uh, politicized recently uh, is, well, I, mean, I mean, I must say that it's been a little bit artificial because we'd reported you know, more than a year ago that um, it was first funded by um, uh, you know, Republican money and then funded by Democratic money. It was pretty obvious that this was, um, that, that the people funding it were people who wanted Hillary Clinton to be elected. So it's not a huge uh, revelation, but the details of that only came out relatively recently, that it was Singer and the Washington Free Beacon, and, and, and then it was, that it was literally the, the Clinton campaign. And so, uh, so I think the, um, the, the breakdown is that essentially uh, Republicans or Trump supporters, certainly his, his allies in Congress, um, are making the case that the dossier is, is just um, is nonsense, it's poison, it's a political document, it's, um, you know, it's essentially cooked up um, by somebody who's paid by the other side, so you can't put any faith in it. And then, you know, in this recent uh, flap over Devin Nunez, the uh, Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, he um, wrote up a little report, which as you know was then declassified and released, uh, that essentially makes the case that a, uh, 
you know, a warrant to eavesdrop on Carter Page, this um, young Russia advisor to the Trump campaign, who was briefly with the Trump campaign, that this Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act um, court order for his, uh, to eavesdrop on Carter Page was based on the dossier, which, which you know, th this, this case on the Republican side is, that's completely improper. It's using, it's politicizing the whole um, intelligence apparatus. It shows the FBI's, um, you know, bad news. The Democrats have written a counter to that, saying that the, that that's grossly oversimplifies the, the, the origins of this surveillance warrant, that in fact there was a whole lot more that went into it, that it actually did note that this was a political document. But the point being that if they that that they use the political document as a basis for this very important yeah. court, court order, and that, that that the Obama Justice Department was basically in league with the Clinton the, campaign, the Clinton campaign exactly. to get to go after the Trump campaign, and that this is the most serious power the government has, right? To eavesdrop on an American citizen, and that it's been put to the to the service essentially of you know a bunch of political hacks who want to elect Hillary Clinton. The Democrats say that's a complete oversimplification and distortion, but their memo we haven't seen yet because uh, President Trump has not uh, seen fit to release it. And how much of the dossier would you say today has basically been stood up as? <laughs> you know, it's funny because there's a, there, you know, the, the idea comes up from time to time from editors. We have a lot of editors. Um, some of them are here. Uh, that why don't we do a, a big, you know, one of these fancy graphics that an analyzes the dossier, what's proven, what's disproven, what's still uncertain. And when we kind of look at that, we say, you know what? Very little is absolutely proven and very little is absolutely disproven. So a whole lot of the dossier, I think, really remains in the, in the realm of, um, of sort of educated guesses to this day, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that Mike, you would disagree, but I mean, I think on the big, the big allegations, uh, the jury's still out. When Comey goes in and briefs Obama on the dossier in January of 2016, right before he tells Trump about it, he says, look, the most salacious things in here, we don't know. But there are significant nuggets and pieces of information, pieces of things that we see here that line up with the intelligence that we have about Russia. This is someone that, in, in Chris Steele, that they had the FBI had relied on before as the source for the, uh, someone that gave them the information that led to the big FIFA investigation they did. He's someone that we trust, and you know, this is not something we're completely dismissing out of hand. It's something that we see similarities between what, what we know based on what we've been looking at on Russia. And it's, been ex it's sort of extraordinary that this you know, material has lingered as a central part of this whole drama over the last year, uh, in part because it's become, it's been so politicized. And the allegations in themselves are so explosive that, um, you know, it'd be hard not to try to examine them and see. Some, them. Something that happened today, um, breaking news, uh, there was, there was a, um, this, this intelligence hearing in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, that went on for several hours. And, and you know, they got into the Russia uh, stuff a good bit. And um, as, as Mike just mentioned, when Comey was FBI director, he described this dossier as salacious and unverified. And one of the senators asked Chris Wray, the new FBI director, uh, cited that, said Comey said it was salacious and unverified. Would you say that that's still what it is? And Wray uh, was silent for a minute and said, I'll tell you more about that in the afternoon session, which is closed. <laughs> so it was, it was a really interesting moment because it would have been easy for him to say, you bet, it's, it's still salacious, it's still unverified, it's no, you know, we're no further down the road, but apparently he wanted to tell them something that he didn't want to tell the rest of us. But the, the other thing, just quickly on the dossier, is that the dossier, you know, who knows why Donald Trump really fired Jim Comey, but the dossier is something that really sets them off on the wrong foot because Comey goes with these intelligence officials to brief Trump the day after he briefs Obama about the Russian hack. And afterwards, Comey pulls Trump aside and says, hey, I just want you to know that there's this dossier floating out there and we have a copy of that. <laughs> and that really, really unnerved Trump, who thought, who has said 
that he thought that Comey was essentially beginning to blackmail him, basically to say, look, we have this very damaging information on you. Now, the rationale from Comey's side was, look, this document's out there. They thought the press was going to write about it. If Trump finds out that we have it and haven't told him about it, he's going to think we're trying to use it against him. But that really began to undermine the relationship. Okay, so um, I'm being signaled that we're going to go to audience questions very soon. And uh, there's two mics up in the front that people can start uh, lining up at if you have questions. Let me ask, um, uh, I have a million things to ask, but, but let me ask Nina um, a little bit about uh, the environment right now that we're in. Uh, the, 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 probably one of the single biggest stories of the last year has been Russia and uh, the, 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 the Russian attempts to um, you know, sabotage the American election. And it has echoes of, as you brought up, the Cold War when Russia was, was, the, was the, uh, the enemy, the, the, you know, the number one enemy of the United States. I'm wondering, what do you see, um, what, is, what is the experience like for you uh, in this environment? Um, and what do you see um, are the real dangers of this environment? Well, the real dangers, I think, uh, is that we're not going to stop it. And we are going to go deeper into that absolute hysteria. And in the meantime, there are issues that need to be addressed in politics and foreign policy, in public relations, in the world that the wor uh, in, in something that the world is going to hell and whatnot. And so that's my fear, is that there is really um, Everybody is so busy either trying to catch Trump or um, expose Putin that we are really not having a conversation that uh, need to be had is that how to get out of there. Because from my point of view, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think the Russians really conducted an intelligence operation on the American elections because that's what Putin does. He conducts intelligence operations. He felt he was totally justified in doing that because they were NSA spying. And so if Americans can spy even on their own allies, such as Germany, why not Russia, America first to call uh, Russia as an adversary? And I think for me is um, a bigger story, I mean, that is a big story, but you know, I'm a Russian, I have very difficult time waking up to every morning saying, woohoo, Ruskies did something. <laughs> <gasps> um, and so it's like, oh, hi, I am a Russian, but don't hold it against me. So this is my now like, everyday mantra. Uh, but I do think that the big story is that whether you find collusion or not of the past, the fact that Trump is not addressing the fact that the Russia is conducting an intelligence operation, all the stories about um, 2018 and how that is going to play out, Putin hasn't given up. I mean, he's going to be more careful, but for him, he hasn't really proven his point yet. He hasn't proven the point that America is hypocritical, America has a hubris, and America sees Russia as it, its adversary. And if it does so, then Russia is going to show that it is, in fact, that kind of adversary. And with Trump completely not willing to address it in any way, actually, he's colluding with the fact that <laughs> Russians continue to, uh, continue to conduct the intelligence operation, not only in the United States and elsewhere, just to prove to everybody that they are no worse than the United States that has done it, is doing it, and may be doing it again. And the hearing that Scott referenced earlier that happened today, Senator Coates, or former Senator Coates, the Director of National Intelligence, said they are fully expecting the Russians to be exactly. to doing the same thing uh, in the upcoming November elections, probably the 2020 elections. And with all of the focus on the past, there's been very little discussion exactly. in Washington about how to prevent it happening. And Trump is not doing anything right. about it right. because mm -hmm. he's, has, he loves you know, how the autocrats of the world unite. Uh, he's not doing anything about it. And I think that is a big danger because, because the two countries go in parallel, essentially not addressing the world that we need to right. address it. OK, so we're going to start going to questions. And uh, as always, uh, the request, uh, the sincere request is ask a question. Uh, please don't give a speech. And, um, and we'll get to as many questions as we can, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Elliot Greenspan with the LaRouche Political Action Committee. I bring this report to you entitled Robert Mueller is an amoral legal assassin. 
he will do his job if you let him, which we released in September. Uh, there's a huge fallacy of composition, and this is what my question goes to. What happened in 2013, 2014? President Xi launched the greatest infrastructure project in history, the Belt and Road Initiative. Immediately, there was a coup organized by Obama, the British, NATO, against, uh, against Russia in Ukraine. Neo-Nazis were put into power in Ukraine. Do you have a, you have a question oh, coming? coming. Okay, that thanks. led to the sanctions. Okay. Christopher Steele wrote 100 memos in that period to Newland and company at the US State Department. What you have is collusion. That's a new school. That's a new school. OK. Question. Question. I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting to it. What you have, oh God. What you have is collusion Ukraine. from British intelligence, as the Washington Post referenced last week, Sir Richard Dearlove through Steele, much, much more collusion between the British crowd. OK. OK. Sir, do you have a question? It's, it's sometimes important to take two minutes to motivate a question. Not with the fashion. In any case, my question is, what is the role at the higher level of, of British intelligence in their intention to destroy an American president who desires good relations with Russia and desires, okay. and desires to work with President Xi yeah. on the Belt and Road Initiative? Okay. Scott, British intelligence, what role did they play in, that we know of uh, besides Steele in, uh, if any, uh, in the pre-election activities? Um, in my, uh, I mean, you know, fr from what I know, um, I, I think British intelligence and US intelligence, you know, work very closely together, share a lot of information, and I actually don't think there's much evidence uh, at all that British intelligence or, in fact, US intelligence set out to undermine this president because he wanted good relations with Russia. <clears throat> Ma'am. Hi. Um, I wonder if you could comment if you have any knowledge of investigation or investigative reporting on people in Congress and their ties to Russia. Um, I'm sure you can name a few like Nunes or Gates or Graham Grassley, Johnson. Any, anybody, um, just one. You just did name a few. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, yes, a few. Um, just if you know yeah. of any investigations or investigative reporting. Um, so we have done some stories about, um, I mean, one in particular, uh, Congressman Dana Rohrabacher of California, Republican, who is no, um, it makes no secret of the fact that he wants better relations with Russia uh, and, and has traveled to Moscow several times, and uh, and in fact, he even had in some run-ins with the FBI uh, because of those ties and the belief that, uh, I mean, nobody ever got as far to, I don't think, suspect that he was an agent of the Russians. They had to sit him down and tell him to stop taking CDs from the Russians that they said had music on it and putting it in his laptop. <laughs> right. It was some foolishness that, you know, he was probably naive, um, but... Um, there, I mean, to this issue of, um, you know, the Russians, like a lot of other countries, uh, seek influence in Washington. It's not uh, a secret, and, you know, the United States seeks influence in a lot of other countries. Um, the Russians have been active and are very, considered very uh, sophisticated in finding possible points of entry with members of Congress. Uh, not necessarily just Republicans, but I think they probably saw uh, a certain vein of the Republican Party that was more uh, amenable to better relations. And that's sort of the, the, that you're seeing with Rohrbacher and others. And, and that's where they may have done their work. Others want to jump in there? I, on the, I mean, it raises a question about counterintelligence, which is what are these counterintelligence operations? And for national security reporters, spent most of the past you know, 10, 15 years focusing on terrorism. So we've had to learn this other language, which is counterintelligence. We've had to learn these issues like this, like are they targeting members of Congress? What does that look like? And that's been a learning experience for us because it's counterintelligence usually doesn't make, it's the sec, FBI's second highest priority. It doesn't make any news and then it makes huge news. You know, there's a Hansen, there's a, there's a big spy issue, there's something like that, there's the 2016 election. So we spent a lot of time learning this issue and what it looks like and what are problems and what's criminal and what's not. 
Okay. Sorry, I just remembered you did a reporting on the NRA issue. Um, the NRA money that went through to certain Congress. Um, so the NRA issue is, a, is an interesting one, and I, uh, there was a, we did a Q&A online on the Times website today uh, where one of the reader's questions was about that issue, was uh, to what extent did the Russians use the NRA to, to uh, infiltrate uh, the Republican campaign? It's one of those things that I think I can't, and I, and I don't know if anyone on the stage can make any firm conclusions. There are, it's been reported that Mueller is looking at this, about the money flow. We did a story last November, December, about a prominent senior Russian, Alexander Torshin, uh, who is close to Putin, who uh, is a lifelong member of the NRA, and he made a overture to the Trump campaign in May of 2016, trying to broker a meeting between Trump and Putin. And, he, and the, the, the overture happened during the NRA convention uh, in Louisville, I believe. Um, it's, an, it's one of those areas of this collusion issue that is fascinating, we've devoted some resources to, we probably should look more at, but I don't think we have any firm conclusions about it. Can I just have a, yeah. little, a little addition to this? Um, this? It could be just a relationship, because politicians have relationship in different countries, and that's exactly what I try to warn against, is that every time that we mention Russia, it must mean something insidious. Mm. Not everything, men, every mentioning of Russia means insidious. Uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was very big friends with uh, Sergei Ivanov, who used to be very close to Putin. It doesn't mean that the Cheney Bush administration was colluding with the uh, Ivanov, uh, Putin, and whatever administration. I just want to say that we have to be very careful when we think that every connection means that there's something uh, absolutely insidious and KGB is going. And on. if I could just echo that, I, I interviewed um, a, a former American ambassador, John Byerly, who was ambassador to Moscow a few years ago. And he said that um, he goes to Russia regularly. And he said that, this is just quite a few months ago now, but he said that he thought the kind of hysterical um, anti Russian feeling was, um, was really getting dangerous. And he said that the anti-Americanism in Russia had, had reached a point where he, was, um, he would show up in Russia and you know, call an, a friend and say, you want to get together for dinner? And in some cases, the friend said, you know, I would really love to, but I don't want to be seen with you because you were an American official. And it could hurt me, it could hurt my work, and so on. And he thought that we were beginning to mirror image in that way. And, um, and treat um, all contacts between Americans and Russians the same way. So I, I totally um, second Nina's point. Yes, sir. Um, hello. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, uh, that you have no proof of any Russian collusion. And why don't you call it conspiracy? That's something you, you usually like to uh, denounce others for, you know, uh, call out, uh, you know, conspiracy theorists or whatever. Um, but the collusion is a conspiracy. Now, I think your presentation, especially over there, is utter uh, academic masturbation, all right? Okay. It's utter garbage, and, no, 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 I'm, Question. No, I, this is, you have this a question, is free sir? speech. Question, no. question. Yeah, where are hey, your tinfoil hats? Ask a short where question. Where are your tinfoil hats, all right? What's that? T where are your tinfoil hats? What? You know? What does it mean? And, and congratulations for being the leading hats? fake news. Okay. Okay, okay goodbye. We, um, wow. Really? We let, their tinfoil hats are at home. We don't have them out tonight. <coughs> um, yes. Yeah, I mean, we, we, yeah, there's you know, I mean, I mean, the gentleman, the gentleman raises a very good point, uh, seriously. And that is that um, these things we're talking about, um, who hacked the DNC, who gave the, the emails to WikiLeaks, um, who uh, you know, posted these uh, fake pages on tw uh, Twitter and, and Facebook and so on, those are mostly hidden. And so, um, so like a lot of the reporting we do, especially in the realm of intelligence, it's, um, it's, it's a matter of getting the best information you can, 
but often you don't have a public document that says, um, you, you know, I, um, Ivan Ivanov broke into the DNC on such and such a day and gave the emails to Julian Assange, my friend, um, and, and said, release them on Putin's birthday. Um, <laughs> but I, I have to say that in the, in the cyber community and in the, intelligence, in the US intelligence agencies, which can be wrong, as Iraq WMD certainly showed, but also in the private cyber companies that do this kind of research, there is um, overwhelming, um, you know, the overwhelming conclusion is that um, the hacking and, uh, and leaking was essentially uh, a Russian state operation. So, but I mean, you know, we all ought to keep open minds. Uh, and, but, and, and as yeah. I said earlier, the, the, the question of, quote, collusion, which is a, a very yeah. rough term, um, is we... Unproven. It's unproven, right? And, and we have, as journalists, have to be very, very careful about how far we go in trying to make a case based on evidence and, and being very upfront in what we don't know. And I hope we've done that, but it's, um, it's, this, is a, this is the trickiness of the story that we're in right now. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, I'm actually Russian, but don't beat me. Um, <laughs> Russian, <laughs> Russians, Russians, they are different uh, people. Uh, actually, I came here to a country because I think that your country is in real danger, but I'm not going to discuss it here. I discuss it with different people at different places. Uh, my question is, how do you think uh, democratic mass media is supportive uh, from the side of the owners? Because the next step of your enemy, which is going to be, and which I predict, is the owners of New York Times or CNN, uh, they receive some very uh, luxury offers, billions of dollars. And uh, maybe in one year, the owner of New York Times might be different. And in one year, among maybe different people, there might be some Russian dictator sitting. And you may, your conversation might be in absolute different way. I'm asking that question because I see that all the turbulence which is now in your country, uh, m m not only, but mainly because you accept dirty Russian money, uh, money which devastates Russia. You welcome, uh, you welcome Russian oligarch, uh, which are buying blocks of, in Manhattan and in different countries. So how, how well do you think you are protected from the side of the owners, must be? I mean, I think the Salzberger family, which owns the Times, has, is as committed to us as anything and has shown over, over, 100, over 100 years how um, important the family ownership of the company is to the independence that we have as a newsroom. And that's happened over many different things besides the 2016 election and what's going on now. And I think that we're all really grateful every day in the newsroom for the family that allows us and protects us to follow the facts and do what we do. And we don't want them to sell tomorrow to um, a Russian oligarch. <laughs> <laughs> if All right, but you both will get your next paychecks. <laughs> In <laughs> rubles. <laughs> um, uh, next question, thank you. It's actually now convertible um, currency, so we're Bitcoin. good. <laughs> it seems like the premise of this whole discussion is that the Russians actually hacked us, hacked our elections, but what do you guys have to say about uh, William Binney's investigation of, that says otherwise, that says it was, impo it was impossible. Uh, William Binney was, he was a... Uh, yeah, I can, I can yeah, answer Scott, that. You wanna, I can you tell him. You that? I yeah. can tell him who. The, so William Binney is a, an NSA retiree, National Security Agency retiree, was um, a very high ranking technical, um, you, you know, technically sophisticated guy at NSA. Um, and he and another, a group of, of retired um, intelligence officers from various agencies, US intelligence officers, have raised questions about the uh, whole premise that, um, it, that, that the Russian state was responsible for this hacking. Um, they haven't really uh, proposed uh, an alternative um, operator, but they've raised a lot of questions about the attribution. Um, I know Bill Binney. I like him, I've known him for years, but he retired from NSA in 2001, 
and I don't think he's uh, a specialist in um, you, you know, hacking attribution. So, and I, but to tell you the truth, I've spoken with him. I've spoken with other, other critics of, of this thesis that we've laid out. And I've, um, you know, so, so we've tried to do a good job of exploring the alternative theories. And I have to tell you that, that um, he is in a very, very small minority in, in believing that um, this, you know, this is not. But, did, not and, but didn't, and, and the minority, though, didn't, didn't either Trump or Mike Pompeo, the CIA director, actually, did, he got an audience with the CIA director, yeah. right? This, yeah. this theory, and did we think yeah. that, because Trump like, took a liking to Tr this, Trump, to this yeah, whole President theory? Trump heard that Bill Binney, an NSA retiree, you know, ha had a theory by which uh, this was not Russia, and he, um, you know, put word out that he wanted Mike Pompeo, the CIA director, to meet with Bill Binney, and they, they met. Um, nothing, nothing came of it because, um, you know, the technical people at NSA and CIA, who are frankly much younger and much more sophisticated about this particular question of hacking and attribution of hacking, um, you know, felt differently. But, but it's, it's a, a legit question. Since Ma'am? question was quick. So, sorry, uh, sorry, we, we need to move on. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Hi. Two, two questions. Is the New York Times following up on two different stories? One, the fact that uh, Jill Stein was sitting to the right of Michael Flynn in that famous picture uh, in which Michael Flynn was sitting next to Putin. And there seems to me to be a question of where Jill Stein got her financing uh, who, and her party won, of course, in those states where a few votes could have cost Hillary the election. That's one. Has that financial story been covered? Two, how is the Times covering the fact of, of President Trump's bromance with Putin, the fact that we hear our information from the Kremlin instead of from our own government, the fact that he is so uh, forgiving of everything that Russia does, et cetera. How, that's, how else does one explain that and explain the fact that he's not uh, following up on sanctions which have been proposed by Congress? How do you explain the very pro-Russian slant? Uh, that's not exactly hard news, but it seems incriminating. I'll take the second part, and then someone wants to take uh, the first part. I mean. I will admit, and I think that that has been one of the things that's been animating this story, is what actually explains Donald Trump's position towards Putin and to Russia. I mean, it's not something that is uh, politically expedient at all. There's never been a constituency in American politics that being pro, where being pro-Russia gets you anywhere. Uh, and he certainly was apart from the rest of uh, the Republican establishment during the campaign in being pro-Russia. Now, that has led to, of course, a lot of different theories. He is beholden to them financially. He, they have something else on him. Uh, they, they cut a deal uh, to get Trump to be president. He's the Manchurian candidate. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of theories, and some are more credible than others. Um, you know, there is also the more, I guess, um, I don't know if it's explainable, but basic uh, explanation that uh, you know, Putin has expressed. Putin says he likes Trump, and tr Trump likes to be liked. And Trump likes authoritarian figures. There is um, he has a history of that, and uh, he has um, done business in Russia. He has seen Putin as being pro-business. There is a past relationship that Putin handles himself and his government in a way that Trump is sort of inclined to. Like, and that is just one explanation. That is, again, a simplistic explanation, but maybe the thing right in front of our eyes. Nina, I'll let Actually, you. I just wanted to add, um, I, I teach propaganda, and this is not a simplistic explanation. Mm -hmm. It's actually very propaganda, almost scientific, is that Trump likes power. Putin represents power. Putin holds the whole world at his fingertip because he is the James Bond of contemporary Russia. <laughs> Seriously, Trump has been trying to build his Trump Tower on the Red Square, uh, I remember since 1995. I mean, that has been such a long bromance. And when he sees, he was trying to meet Putin in 2013, as you may remember, when he brought his Miss Universe and he was running around because he was promised that Putin would come uh, to, uh, to the pageant. And, Putin didn't and was really very upsetting for Trump. So he really has been courting that country for such a long time. He wanted his name next to the Kremlin and 
totally understand that for, for the man with such an ego. Uh, so, uh, so I do think that that really drove his, um, his desire to have better relationship with Russia because he could finally get his Trump Tower there. And I think it's really almost that simple. Uh, anyone want to deal with Jill Stein and how much, I mean, I will, I will admit that we have not done, uh, you know, there were stories about, but we have not dug into I mean, that the, issue. The only thing that, we haven't really looked into the money, and maybe we should, but the only thing I can say is that after the um, nomination of, of Trump and Clinton, some of the um, Facebook pages that have been uh, now identified as Russian in origin were pumping um, Sanders and Stein hard and basically trying to say you, you don't want to betray the cause and go with Clinton. So, so apparently their, call, you know, their, their, their goal was to hold down Clinton's total by, um, by playing to those audience and p playing up the, the sort of, you know, you don't betray Bernie by going with Clinton. Okay, I'm sorry, this is going to be the last question. Okay. Um, so. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> So my question is about, it might be more of a legal question, but, you know, um, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you find the 30,000 emails. The fact that Roger Stone knew that the Podesta emails were hacked before, you know, and he was part of the campaign. Why, like, I, you know, Trump sh touts fake news, fake news. No, Trump, I hear it from your mouth. I hear it from your tweets. I get m my news directly from you. And, and, it's, and it's bad. So why is this not, you know, and then there's this investigation. But to me, Russia, if you're listening, the 30,000 emails, right. is, is already collusion. Like, why, why, why doesn't this stuff that we as ordinary citizens know for sure happened, why doesn't it matter? Well, I think, so it's a, it, it's a good question. And I think that the... You know, we have to always step back for a second and take in everything that we've encountered the last over a year, right? I mean, on the face of it, right, Trump saying, you know, Putin, if you're listening, release those emails. I mean, it's an extraordinary um, thing for a president, presidential candidate to say that he wants a foreign power that's hacked his rival to release the emails. And sometimes I think we're lost in the daily Trump deluge of craziness right, of these stories that come out that we don't step back and, and see it. But the question, of course, is legally is, is there a crime, right? Is there actually anything illegal for him saying it? Or any number of real weird coincidences, do they add up to a case? Mike, do you want to address I, that? I, mean, the, I was saying this before. We spend all this time trying to figure out, I spend my days trying to figure out what Trump has done in private to only find out he's done the same things in public. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's this very interesting question because there's a part of Trump that will speak his mind in a way that a president has never spoken his mind before. He's going to get on Marine One. He'll stop and tell you what he's thinking. It may be confusing. It may be offensive. It may be wrong. But he will tell you what he is thinking. And if there are ever any consequences for Trump legally on this, it'll be very interesting to see what the ramifications are of the tweets. Was he trying to intimidate Comey? Was the, what, were those statements like that trying to collude with the Russians? It's an unusual thing that I've certainly never seen in the legal field, but what do his public statements mean to his actions? Because when he says to Lester Holt, Russia on my mind, it sort of answers a question of sorts. So it'll be interesting to see what those ultimately mean. Right, and, and is, there, you know, is there ultimately legal implications or is there any, uh, legal case underpinning the public statements that Mueller will get to. And maybe we'll be here a year from now discussing the exact same things and have some of the same questions. Maybe we'll have more answers. I hope we do. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I wanted to thank everyone again for coming out tonight and for uh, participating in the discussion. Thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs> Could have gone another hour. <laughs>